went to the Army and uh, told them I wanted to go to the toilet, but I wanted to pick out a course. Who stopped these MPs at Jeeps? Where should we not go inside down? Tudor Street. I'll go to Tudor Street. They, they left and we went to Tudor Street. I never talked to a parish at all about Vietnam. I was sitting there and I was like, man, the whole top of the tent disappeared. We had no idea what we're up against. Body parts. Wow. It's like Armageddon. Somebody had called in and put the magic dragon. Hey guys, Dan here with Battlefield Curator, and we've got quite the interview for you today. We're interviewing uh, Mr. Pat here, who served in the Vietnam War. He's got some uh, combat experience, sharing some combat stories. He's, he's got some insight on the M16 and the M14, both of which he used during his time over there. He also, uh, we also go over why he thinks that it takes a special woman to be married to a soldier because of the lifestyle and the different things. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right into it. Let's, let's uh, start off with, uh, you know, where you're from, how, how you grew up, where you grew up, how your parents are, you know, what kind of influence they had on your life growing up. It's, it's a lot of story. I was born in Oklahoma, and my dad was in the Army Air Corps, B-25, B-26, and uh, he met my mother there in Oklahoma, and I got married before I was born. After he got out of his service, he moved back to California, and that's where I grew up, in the San Diego area. I was a senior high school in 1964. I graduated, but never heard, really heard of Vietnam when out there. Then I got became on the news pretty regular, and I thought, well, I've heard that, you know, if you get drafted, you're going to go infantry. It doesn't sound like what I want to do. So I joined the Army, and uh, they gave me a choice of what, what I wanted to do, and I took an electronics course. Did you want to go to college at all, or did you? Well, I was going to. Similar, I went to uh, junior college and working full time, but I couldn't do both. Okay, and this is in in the sixties. I was working at a gas station, a big gas station. I had a COVID open and all that, but uh, I had to I had to quit school because if I quit work, I couldn't go to school. So I kept that, and that's so why I went to the uh, the army and uh, told them I wanted to go to join, but I wanted to pick out a course. And it was a guaranteed course. So I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. But I had to go up to Los Angeles to take a bunch of tests all day long. You call us after this, and they come back and said, yeah, you passed it. Well, I picked a course out, and they gave me a signed letter saying that you're guaranteed when you get out of the basic training, this is your course. And I went to go in Georgia oh, wow. for an uh, electronics course, 16, 18 weeks, something like that. And I went to Germany. All right. So how was your time in Germany? It was great. I was waiting there at the airport, waiting to go to Germany. This guy was getting off. And um, I said, were you in Germany? He said, yeah, I was there. And I said, well, so like over there. And he said, well, do you drink beer? And I said, no, I don't drink beer. He said, you don't like it then. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> but when I got older, I kept an eye on everybody. And there were guys that, after payday, they'd go downtown and visit the bars and all that and get drunk and whatever. And I got on train and traveled. So you traveled Europe and you had a good time. Uh, did you drink beer? Nope, I don't drink beer. Did you drink liquor? I had to drink wine sometime because you can't drink the water over there. Oh, okay. But uh, you get sick. Anyway, so. And what year were you over there? What year were you over there? That was 60, 66. Okay. 67, 68. I was over there, but. I went to, uh, I love Bavaria in Germany, beautiful place. Went to the Eagle's Nest over there, which was getting this summer, winter retreat. Really nice place. And on top of this mountain, you can see seven different countries on a clear day. Oh, wow. And uh, they had a big bunker up there. It was over, it was over around in, uh, twice, once by American commandos and once by German, I mean, uh, English. And, uh, well, they overtook it twice. Anyways, I really liked it all. It was beautiful. And then I went to uh, Austria, Switzerland, and Italy. And... So was it a tourist attraction? Was the uh, Eagle's Nest a tourist attraction, or was it just occupied by military? So you, you went there for training? No, I, I, I was there for, to do a job. We had a, a uh, shop where we repaired electronic equipment. Okay. It came in from all over Germany. 
Do you remember what the MOS designation for your job was? 35B20 and 35B30. And as I progressed, it got a little higher. I got really good at it. And uh, I actually went over there a second time, and I got placed on a reforger unit. Oh, okay. And I didn't care for that at all because we maintained and, and the equipment over there. If something broke out, our troops came over. The equipment was already there, so we drove tanks, kept track of all the munitions, weapons, and things. And I, I said, well, I'm getting out of this because I'm losing my MOS. And so I put in for a transfer, and the first sergeant said, no, nobody ever gets out of here. Thirty days later, I was gone. Oh, wow. And I went back to Manheim, where I was the first time, and went back to the same shop. But it was kind of strange because I didn't know anybody there. The first time, I knew everybody. So I got promoted and everything. But in between time, uh, right after that, I came back from Germany the second time. I went to Fort Gordon. And, uh, no, I went to... Uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. Oh, okay. And we tested weapons for the Army of White Sands. Okay, what kind of weapons were you testing? Well, while I was there, we were testing the uh, Vulcan Chaparral system. Oh. Huh. Chaparral was ground on sidewinder missiles on an uh, APC. Okay. And the, the Vulcan was 20 millimeter cannon like the minigun. Oh, okay, okay, nice, yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty awesome, man. We were testing this guy to come out there, and uh, he loaded that thing up with uh, 20 millimeter HE. And the big boulder sitting out in the desert was all, all the desert. And he said, Now, what's that boulder out there? Bull. He turned away, it was pea gravel. He said, You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> it was pretty interesting. Yeah, that's pretty cool, yeah. And then, then we actually tested, uh, they had drones that we were shooting at. Okay. Uh, prop driven, and they had to put a seat pile on it because the side one of the missile wouldn't. Tech. Mm -hmm. So then they actually had the jet draws, which were expensive. Uh, it, it would track them real good. And, and uh, I was on a, a tracking station at a 35 millimeter motion picture camera, and there was six of them out there. Huh. And three would track the missile, and three would track the drone, and they could tell exactly how much it missed if it did miss. And uh, we were out there one day, and the uh, commercial airline was flying over. And they just fired a missile, and they said, it destructed on a missile. We did. It won't, it won't destruct. They hit it, hit it, And they said, well, get radio contact with the airliner or restricted airspace. All right, let's take a little intermission and thank our sponsor, Tony, here with All American Firearms. Hey, <laughs> it's this Tony over here at All American Firearms. We offer uh, all kinds of uh, good stuff. Uh, good firearms. We've got vintage and new firearms used. Uh, we also offer ammunition, accessories, custom-made holsters, training of all sorts, concealed weapons permit, defensive shooting, um, beginners courses, and uh, we even offer a countering the mass shooter program. Come by sometime. We're located in Aiken, South Carolina. Check out our website. Uh, Dan will put the information of our social media in his description. Oh, wow. And uh, it was up there, and then they tried to get a hold of them, and then something happened. All of a sudden, you see the plane just turn like this real fast. And it's a dive out there, and the missile was going right after it. And then the self destruct took place. We could hear it. You see, push, you know, and boom. Oh, wow. This was all on cameras. I can imagine there's this applied, and the navigator don't have a job anymore. <laughs> they have over restricted airspace at White Sands. Yeah. Wow. So, so this missile what was already tracking stuff. But they were flying in a, in a restricted airspace, yeah. and the missile system yeah. got the, track of them. The missile walked off to them. See, they were they were like thirty, forty thousand feet away. Yeah, and the missile walked off to it. And it, and it wouldn't self destruct before the you know before it, it got close. Yeah, it wouldn't do it. that could have been a and really big tragedy. Just yeah, that radio contact. You can see the plane is like this, and it took off. You know, way off the side. Yeah, pretty pretty hefty move there. But uh, and then all of a sudden you can see the, the missile just poof. Wow. And then boom. Stripped the whole area, you know. Wow. So we shut down for the day. Wow. <laughs> and we don't know what happened after that. Wow. So, wow. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun over there. I mean, yeah. We were out there. It was really neat. We were uh, attached to the Air Defense Board. Uh huh. It was a test to Fort Bliss. And uh, from what I understand, all the missiles everywhere serve the same thing at every meal. Well, it didn't work that way for us. Man, we had steaks, all, all kinds of stuff to eat there. The best missile I've ever been in. Okay, okay. They were sensible at Fort Bliss, Texas. And I got, uh, 
I got orders from there to go to Vietnam. So, so how did you get orders to go to Vietnam? Like, what happened? You just came down. They put me in to go to Vietnam. And, and that was just you, not the unit? Just me. I was, I was a replacement. Oh, you were a replacement. Okay. A replacement, yeah. Wow. And, uh, my mom and dad came to see me at Fort Bliss at 1968 Christmas. Uh-huh. And uh, still didn't know I was leaving. And, and they left, and they, they went. It was a good surprise. I didn't know they were coming. But they left, and then I got my orders to go to Vietnam. Actually, I went up for uh, E-7. Okay. Starting first class. And uh, I passed the board. That was a tough board. But as a colonel, lieutenant colonel, two captains, one officer, three or four lieutenants, old first lieutenants, were asking me all these questions, you know. Mm-hmm. And I passed. I got my E-7. But they said I wouldn't get it until... Uh, Later on that, that years, I went to Vietnam in 86. Here I'm going over as a platoon sergeant, and they had no idea what was going on in Vietnam. Here I'm going to be a platoon sergeant. So so you're going there as a platoon sergeant in the Vietnam, and, and this is your first combat tour. Yeah, yeah. And that's what the order said, platoon sergeant. But when I got to, I got to sit to a uh, magnus unit, they repaired radar. Yeah. So that's what I was basically doing when I was over there. Traveled all over Vietnam, ran into some pretty rough situations. It's kind of bad because I was 23 years old. Wow. A staff sergeant. There were all the other NCOs over there were older and didn't like me. It was really hard putting up with all them guys, but it's... And they, and I'm guessing they'd probably been in Vietnam maybe once before. Some of them had, but they'd been in the Army for like forever, you know. Oh, okay. So, that, yeah. Make, like, make E6 or E7. Them guys had been in for like... Nine, ten years, you know? Yeah, yeah. And at this point, how long were you in the, the Army for? It's a little over three years. Oh, really? I was at Fort Bliss. Yeah. Fort Bliss. Okay. Then I, then I made my E6 there. Wow, so you made E6 in about three to four years. Yeah, and I had I had six and a half years in grade of E6 when I went for the E7 board. Uh-huh. So, and I would have been in nine and a half years, been E7. Those guys were pretty mad at you because you'd only been in for three or four years, yeah. and they'd been in for 10 years, so and you were already a higher rank. I ended up catching a lot of dirty work. Yeah. And uh, but there was these guys that couldn't get to do anything, and they gave them all to me. And I was in charge of the our section, the perimeter of the compound. So they were working for me, and they were like 18, 19 years old, you know. And we could communicate because we, there wasn't that much different between us. Years. Yes. And uh, I had no problem with them. I mean, they, they'd do anything I tell them to. And we, well, that's pretty good, yeah. Built guard, built guard towers, put Constantine wire, set out clean more mines, that kind of thing. And then, then I got called on missions to go to these different fire bases. Okay. All over the place. All through Central Highlands. And, uh, okay, Pleiku, Contum, Docto. My first... Two weeks later, there was a big, a big hill above our compound. It was a Korean uh, ammunition dump. So they blew it. Okay. And it shook the ground we were sitting on. And we went to read a word for a long time, you know, and I thought, over oh, there two weeks, you know, and we didn't know what was going on, you know, yeah, what was going to happen, you know. But there. Uh, so you go over there, and the Tet Offensive, the, the, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong uh, counter offensive. Had already took in pl- took place and was still going on. Still so down. so when yeah. Because from what I understand, the way it went during the Tet Offensive, they hit every major every major base the same day, the same time, and these were mostly NVA. Uh huh. Or troops. So but we were up at one time. It was in the go February, March, April, May, sometime in May. Uh, you lose track of time over there for sure, but. We already hit one fire base and fixed the radar. We came down. We were on the road all day getting up there. Hit another fire base and fixed theirs and went, went over this one. It's a major fire base. From what I understand, it had like eight 105s and one 8-inch gun. Wow. So you were traveling a lot. Were you ever uh, cognizant about, were you ever concerned about uh, like road mines or IED? Oh, land mines, yeah. We, we, uh, we left uh, Play Coop. When we left there, we had to wait for a convoy. We started to take off. 
and they blocked everybody. They said, no, this is the landmine went off up here. And it was a landmine. It was a hole in the ground. You could put a tank in and wouldn't see it. Oh, wow. And it, they figured this was like a 55-gallon drum full of explosives. Jeez. And a uh, uh, deuce and a half with how many guys were there, we don't know. Just disappeared. I mean, the mind blew wow. piece. Crazy. The, the front end differential was over here, and the engine was over here. I mean, these pieces everywhere. And they couldn't find who was in it or how many. Wow. Well, we were there. So we had to wait until they cleared all the mines. We went up there. Actually, we went to this one up north and here, and then we, we go, go back down to this one just outside of Pleiku. And uh, I was dead tired, man. We had been on the road for two days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The guys told us, well, let's get this radar for you. We got to have it now because they use a weather radar to do the fire missions for the big gods. Uh -huh. And so we, we we got that fixed. And the guy said, you have to worry about it. You're going to get some sleep now since uh, we've been getting nine months. So I said, okay, so I'm going to lay down for a minute. And, and I'm going to go get me some lead, take a shower. I laid down and passed out. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, I got up and they had to use the bathroom. The train was down by the perimeter. Uh -huh. I walked down there. Nothing only but a pocket knife, you know. I, I get back up here, and I, I lay down in my, in my bulk, and I'm laying there, and just boom, boom, the ground shake. I really got a fire mixer. They ring a bell before they do the fire mission. So I set up. It's it looks either Sam and I are three deep, three or four deep out that way, and we're sitting in the bulk that's this high. Hmm. I'm sitting there, and I was like, bam, the whole top of the tent disappeared. Oh, wow. I grabbed my rifle, pistol belt, and I ran in and laying bulk, and it took three hits. Boom, 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 right across the Double sealer though. Wow. And the rockets they were using had to penetrate and then explode, see, wouldn't on impact. Ah, okay. And so we were in the same flying everywhere, and guys were yelling, and, and for the next five or six nights, they used a knife we fought. Wow. What kind of weapons did you have with you? You had? I had my M14. So you had M14. And then uh, had a 45. Yeah, and then uh, had a M79 grenade launcher. Okay. And so, and that was your that was your kit for your mission set that you were doing. It was, it was four rows, and that was weapons we had. Okay, so all of you guys were armed with with an M seventy nine. We had one M seventy nine. Okay, so just one. We had M fourteens. X amount of rounds. I don't know how many it was. Okay, but um, oh. I went out by the outside the bunker. It was an M sixty machine gun thing out there. We were we'll fire off down there, and everything got kind of quiet. And I looking down the jungle. You see this the lights going in the jungle. So I'm watching this thing. There's a little bit of light there. And I took my M79. And I'm like, crank the side up. And I fired a hit out there and the light went out. Oh, wow. <laughs> then we got all this. Don't do that. <laughs> so, like, they're going to know where we are. I think they know where we are. Yeah. But anyway, it went out. and uh, that, Wow. I eventually ran out of ammunition for my M14. Okay. So I grabbed an an M sixteen land somewhere and went and then they had to fly in ammunition for everything. Food and water. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, we were all eating out of camp when we could eat. So where'd you get the M sixteen from? Was there an armory by there or did that unit did that unit have an armory or did when it what happened? No, well, the M sixteen they were laying everywhere. We lost oh, yeah. three guys the first night. Oh wow. And there was three hundred on the fire base. We lost thirty the first night. Wow. And uh, we had no idea what we're up against. And out by where the machine gun base was, uh, it was a big hill. I saw one daylight. It went up like this, and probably a thousand yards wide and several several hundred meters out, you know. And we call it moon dust. It was red powder, but it was like getting your teeth, your skin. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. We were, also, we started taking another hit. Bit, real bad. And they said that the main block route on the other helicopter left with one block route. There were three guys. They said they put a sausage charge in there big enough, well, 10 times that size. I never found the three guys that were in it. Oh, wow. They were gone. Anyway, we were getting hit, and um, somebody popped a big flare on the mortar. And when the dirt was, you couldn't see the dirt. There was that many troops there. Wow. Coming down that hill. What little here I had on the back of my neck started standing up. I said, Man, we had it. About that time, they, somebody had called in and pushed the Magic Dragon. Too many guns on them that they fired, 308. And they, they, they dropped a big flare, but just tall and that big around. It lit the whole place. 
see them guys, man, they're coming down. And, oh, God. Everybody's shooting, you know? Oh, wow. And that man, he got cut loose on and just, if you ever take a water hose and go like this, how the water does, that's the way the bullets were going like that. Just yeah, wow. Fire. And, uh, and you couldn't see anymore because dust was flying everywhere. They kept on, kept on, kept on. He fired till he was empty. And a second one came in. And they wow. fired. And he, he circled. And uh, we could see him all right then when they did it. Because at nighttime, they popped another flare. We could just barely see. And just bodies laying out there. Wow. And uh, so the next morning, overcast anyway. The next morning, there was like just five or six bodies laying out there. They took them all away. Oh, wow. And uh, but, uh, I don't know how many, how, many, how many died out there, but a lot of people died. What I understand, I didn't see the gun, but they said the one fire were laying down like this, and they were shooting canister rounds out across the place with a helicopter in there. Uh-huh. And in, in the next, next ward, some of the young guys, they would take a picture and say, you want some pictures? I said, I don't want that. I don't need it. Went out there. And the, the landing strip out there was, just, I don't forget what you call that metal stuff they put together yeah. on the ground. The whole that. Um, nothing but body parts laying out there. Oh, wow. Body parts. Wow. It's like Arlington. Like Crazy. And then uh, they were, I got there with a gro- road grader with a gas mask on, scraping the bodies off there so the helicopters could come in. And uh, and then uh, one over here digging a ditch, they just pushed them all in the ditch. Wow. Get them off. The, but, um, wow. Anyway, so this went on five or six days. I got the paper over this tells the day, so I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. It's over 50 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So when at night, did you use night vision or how did how did that work? Uh or was it just Pop flares? Flares near there, shoot them. If they ball up, like, you'd be out there, something would blow up and make a big flash. Uh-huh. You see these guys coming at with bayonets, man, just towards the right at you, you know. You got to stop them, man. Wow. But uh, even when the sun was starting to come out, you were still overcast all the time. Uh-huh. And uh, you, you couldn't really see a whole lot. Now, main people had night vision, dark lights. Oh, they had the starlight scopes, yeah. So probably on the watchtowers. But we didn't have one, but they, they were coming up at us so that we could see them, you know. Yeah. Somebody shooting that shit at night, you know. And they're, but uh, I did the best we could, but well, luckily they didn't hit our radar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then you would have been stuck there even longer trying yeah. to fix that thing. Commander, this, you know, we, it looks pretty good so far right now, so if you guys want to leave here and have sleep. Yeah. And we're going to do some after we went on down, we're going to drive over 100 miles. I don't remember the exact mile is still had me on no sleep. Wow. And we, we got back down there, our home base, and I uh, came in with everybody coming running up. You know, they heard it was a big fight up there. Yeah. And they heard it. It had been overrun. We were killed. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so they, they were thinking you were KIA before you guys even had a chance to say anything. Yeah. We looked like how we had that any nope. clean clothes on the two nope. weeks. Yeah. Sand flying everywhere. Yeah, I walked over. Wow. First, first started, and he looked at me, and he says, go to bed. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, first started. They just, they just let us sleep all we wanted to. Wow. And luckily, we weren't being hit right there. And anyway, we've got people asked me, yeah. were you behind the lines? There were no lines. There definitely weren't. No. Their commander sent a letter down thanking our unit, letting us stay there, and that we we volunteered to stay there, you know. Uh-huh. And that, well, I don't know, but... The, we did, and uh, wow. You know, he sent a letter down, and they gave me a copy of that letter, and I got it over there in that folder. We were surrounded by one NVA battalion, wow, and one sapper battalion. A full strength battalion is a thousand people. That's two thousand. Wow. If I'd have known that, I don't know if I'd have made it or not. You know. <laughs> We did the best yeah. we could what we had. Yeah. And then how, how big was that fire base that you were at? Probably 300. 300. Wow. Approximately three. We lost 30 in the first night. And after that, I don't know. I got no idea. Yeah. Wow. And luckily, none of our guys were hit. There was four of us. One of the four was a, a war officer mm. over the radar thing. We, I never saw him until we left. Oh, really? I don't know where he was. Where he was hiding out at? We were working on the radar and he disappeared. I don't know where he was. He was wow. somebody somewhere. I don't know. Huh. Interesting. But, uh, anyway, there was... Yeah, warrant officers have a tendency to disappear a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's probably at the command block here. Or if they had a little officer's club here, I don't know what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they probably weren't drinking when this was going on, but <laughs> never know. But, uh, never know. All our names were on it. Literally came down. 
and uh, the, the dates and the times and everything. And uh, I'll tell you, Jim, a little story. After I got out of the army, come I never talked to my parents at all about Vietnam. Never did. Uh-huh. And my dad passed away, and then my mother was in nursing home. Well, I was sitting over there with her on the porch. We were drinking some cold all the time. She was there six years, and uh, she said, you know, one time when you were over there, I knew what she's talking about. I got scared. There's something wrong. Bad draw was going on. And she said, they lived in California at the time, and they had a nice that area. And she was out walking around that block every night for a week, praying for you. Oh, wow. And she was just scared to death. And then she passed, and I got looking through her Bible, and I found a note. She wrote on there, and I won't tell you what was in the note, but I'll tell you one thing that was in there. It gave you the exact times and days that we were being hit. Wow. You can read it. And she was she was praying those days. Praying those she days. was praying hard. She gave the exact times and dates. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I wish she was still alive. I could have told her about that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I got in the pool over there. But, uh, and I've told that story to a lot of people and told to a couple of veterans that they cried. Wow. But, uh, just, you know, you wouldn't want my prayers of God, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Wow, it's intense, yeah. That was at the, that, that was a fire base oasis we were in. And and the weapons that you had, so did you still have that M16 that you took while you were in that fire base? Or did you did you bring the M16 and the M14? Or? Um, I left the M16 there, and we got some more ammunition for M14s. Okay. We only had the M14s. We got, we got sniper fire a few times going back, and uh, the roads, mostly, luckily, after getting out of there, were mostly paved. Okay. But they weren't real wide, and they kind of up high because you had rice paddies on both sides. And we got down there, and uh, it was getting dark. And, uh, yeah, I was on sort of the guard one night. I just knew lieutenant. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Those are fun. <laughs> Shine boots. He wanted to go out and check the guards. I said, okay, we got in the Jeep and went up there, and uh, we stopped in front of the guard tower. He probably about 30, 40 feet from the guard tower. And he said, that guy up there's asleep. I said, no, he's not. I knew every guard out there. I know. He'd be a good Polish guy, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's in a minute. He was like, he's sneaking up the ladder, right? I said, don't do that. Sneaking up there. He got up to the top of his clank and the bullet slams. He's looking down the barrel of an M14 rifle. <laughs> he uh, 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 he didn't watch that. He didn't know the password. Wow. He couldn't remember it. And I told him that he knew where I was. Yeah. That, that's the officer's guard. Let him go. Let him go. Or he said, he said oh, you can go. <laughs> he can go back again. He just, I think we'd go back now. <laughs> <laughs> they had to go clean his pants out. Yeah. <laughs> he, he would have shot him. No doubt no more. Oh, yeah. That yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you don't play like those. Uh, the Viet Cong were notorious for yeah. trading bases. Some of the other radar we would go was called 54, 55, and they were ground radar. Mm-hmm. And it was on a tripod and a big bolt. And you had to sit a handful of it. And a good guy, we tested out and uh they let the guy out there 500 meters out. This radar, you will know, pick him up, you pitch up the noise, you could hear him walking. Oh, okay. And uh, you do a little dial there, and he tells he's 500 meters out there. And here's the azimuth and all this down here. Call that strike and hit him. He never saw you. Wow. Pitchy 4, Pitchy 5, we used a lot of those over there. Pretty neat, but we repaired calibrated those. Oh, wow. And we had a, one guy, he um, watched our CEO. And the mm-hmm. sergeant called me in, and uh, I didn't have a weapon room. He laid a 45 on the desk, and he says, this is the man you're going to take. You're going to take him to Long Men Jail. Don't let him get away. Huh. So we got out of the aircraft, and Venus Bucks are here in the F-14, I had them, the 45. Got out of the aircraft and uh, flew down from where we were down to uh, Thompson Lake. Just mm-hmm. inside of Saigon. Okay. So we got down here, we took a bus, and it went up. LBJ, then the mayor Delta, yeah, and been jail. Uh, <laughs> I got up here and the guy said, We can't take him, you don't have all paperwork. Oh, wow. Oh, got to fly all the way back in like, three, four hundred miles. On he said, No, we're just a pistol shot away from 
U.S. Army headquarters, Vietnam. Oh, okay. In Long Beach. Yeah. So we went over there, and just luckily, the officer on duty was a JAG officer. Oh, nice. So that worked out good for us. I said, this guy really got it made, don't you? Yeah. Came out of building. I was sweating. I froze while I was in there. Really? I mean, these are big, modern buildings, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he, he did everything, typed it up in sight, and says, you're good to go. So we, we went back over there, and uh, you know, and, and uh, they got this big, what's called chain link fence. Uh-huh. And they rolled it back, and we went in. It's like a little cubicle in there, chain link fence. And they brought this guy in there, stripped him butt naked, and body searched her. And did what? For weapons. They body searched him for weapons. They bought his what? After they stripped him. They bought his what? Hmm? They did what? They body searched him. Searched oh, they body, body, him. They body searched him, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so we, we were standing looking at the chain link fence. Yeah. And they marched and stabbed across the parade field inside there, butt naked. And that's the last we saw her. Wow. Can you imagine being jailed in a combat zone with no weapon? Yes. <laughs> I got, wow. I got some good pictures of it over there, but uh, anyway, we went back and uh, going to get a flight back, right? Oh, we can't get another flight for three days. Huh. Oh, this is great, you know. <laughs> we don't know anybody here. Yeah. Let's go see Saigon. Saigon was right there. So you went a little sightseeing tour. So we went. Yeah. And we, we stopped. Who stopped these MPs in a jeep? We said, Where should we not go in Saigon? Tudo Street. Don't go to Tudo Street. Okay, they left. We went to Tudo Street. <laughs> you know, walking down Tudo Street, I'd always heard about it. Everyone I got the bars and those. Yeah, we don't keep it a bar, but I found a good place to buy some more film on Tudo Street. So, oh, okay. So we did that, and then we got us a room for the night. Caught a cold, air conditioned room. Oh man, we took some more pictures. I got some good pictures of Saigon, and one picture down. Remember she showed it up? It was a 1958 Chevy sitting there. Nice. And Saigon. Yeah, just sitting there, huh? And I almost got run over by a pimp in a brand new red Firebird. <laughs> he been laughing at me. You get out of that car, I'd have shot him. Wow. But uh, he kept on calling him. Red Firebird, brand new one. Wow. He's had that money, yeah. Well, pimp, yeah, they got money. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I got a lot, a lot of good pictures here, and then we went, we caught a flight. We went back to uh, Queen Yard, where we based it. I didn't remember. I didn't remember to tell you we, when we were at the firebase. We used to be pretty much overrun. When I got there, I was I was a squad leader. Sometimes with two sword. they gave me a selector switch from M14. Oh, okay. And that made it fully automatic. She turned it, and I had to use it a couple of times. But uh, it was when things just start blowing up, and you can see just the flash. You can see all these people coming at you. Here they are, here. So I just put it on that, and I just turned the side, and they walked it right out across there. Wow. Couldn't do that much because you burned your barrel out. Yeah, yeah. Same round as the M60, M60 machine gun. Yeah, it's a 762 by 51. Yeah. Yep. If you shoot like this, I've heard people say, when you're shooting birds, that's the second shot. No, you're not. You turn the sideways, it'll walk you right across the field. Yeah. yeah. So it came in handy. Saved our, saved our tail a few times. Huh. I was the only one that could have had it. Of course, our uh, <laughs> warrant officer, he had a pistol, but anyway, <laughs> wherever he was. And that's probably why he was just hiding out. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. Anyway. Yeah. And I, I learned to read people pretty well over there. Yeah. That's why when I got these young guys, in, I call them my dirty dozen. Yeah. They'd do anything I said, and uh, we built guard tower, put out clean one lines, anything. And one time the first sergeant got onto him by not getting a haircut. And for a start, he was bald on top with his hair around his back. Uh-huh. And he said, now, tomorrow, in four minutes, you're going to have a haircut. So I told the guys, get a haircut. You know, so they did. They were out there, and uh, five, five or six of them. He said, no, oh, man, you should take your hands like that. They called this first sword the haircut. Their head was bald and just hair around. So <laughs> <laughs> we all got quite a laugh out of that. But I, didn't, I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah. But that was pretty cool. That's pretty funny, yeah. 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 And then another guy, he was a he was a cook. We were on a shoulder people. He was a cook. And he was on guard duty. Mm-hmm. He was checking all the weapons and everything. And uh, I took a weapon and I couldn't pull the bolt back. Huh. He was froze. He was all cleaned up, you know. Checked his ammunition. The ammunition was green. It was all. He wouldn't come out of magazines or nothing. Oh wow! So for the next month, they sit in front of the first sergeant and clean their weapon and, 
and put fresh ammo and everything else. Yeah. So when I'm a cook, cooks get killed. Yeah. <laughs> it's like anybody else, you know. Yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah. Immunity to mosquitoes, man, that's the thing was terrible. We had to take these malaria pills, big old orange things, once once a week, I think it was. Oh wow. And then if you went to the Highlands, you took the white pill every day. And we got this new guy in. <laughs> and he was getting sick and he had diarrhea. He was all messed up. Mm. He said, I, th I think it's the big one, one pill I'm taking every day. Actually, that's ain't got nothing on the more pills if you take them every day. Oh, yeah? I mean, it will clean you out. And that's what he would do. He was losing weight, man. He was looking bad. Wow. He got confused with the white pill. Oh. Took every day in the... So we, we told him about that. He started feeling, oh, thank you guys for telling me about that. <laughs> it was something else, you know. Wow. I think it was every week. Might have been every month. I don't remember. Big old pill. Mm -hmm. But I know after about three, I was over there three months, the mosquitoes wouldn't bite me anymore. They fly it around, but it wouldn't bite me. Huh. I think it was something in them pills. Wow. Yeah. Maybe something that altered the sweat glands. I'm not saying that. I don't know what I mean. Yeah. Couldn't be. I don't know. And, and they, you can hear the mosquitoes coming in squadrons, man. They just fly it everywhere, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And the, and the Stars and Stripes paper, you're familiar with that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Started putting the end little cartoons in there, and uh, they had uh, these two guys sitting in the foxhole, and the mosquito came in, and, and the mosquitoes were talking there to each other. They said, should we eat them here, or should we take them into the woods? They said, if we take them into the woods, the big ones will get him. <laughs> then they stayed the mosquitoes all in there could stand flat and uh -huh. rape a turkey. Uh -huh. So, little that's <laughs> weren't saying not really, but they were they were big. Yeah, yeah. So let's go back to um, like how did you you finally got out of uh, Saigon, right? Oh well, yeah. Well, we, yeah. we 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 caught a flight that and at uh, Thompson Leap Air Base, C one thirty. We flew back up there where we were before, and now uh, we had, let them know we were there. They sent the truck in and picked us up. Mm -hmm. Her hills. Had this one one place we could take the highways all the way back up to where we were going. And I had this one I thought it was one black fella. He was over there too. And he's talking about this pass I can't remember the name of it. It was Mang Yang Pass. He said, Yeah, it was. That's where they had a lot of ambushes in Europe. A road cutting the side of the hill. Hill here and down there and the you know, tanker trucks and everything laying down when they all got, you know, hit. Uh -huh. And uh, we had to go through that luckily we didn't get hit there. One one new gun truck they put in there and put a mini gun on it, and they named their trucks Brutus and Mini. Huh. Mini was the gun, Brutus was the truck. And they got hit down there, and the firefight lasted about five minutes, and it was over. We wow. All just cut them to pieces. Yeah, wow. And what they would do, they would, trucks right along the hillside, it's just now there, hill there, going on there. The, the lead truck they'd hit with a recoil his rifle to take it out. The rear truck that take it out, and anyone to hit an antenna on that took them out. And then he's fishy. Yeah, fishing the yeah, because now the, the all the convoy is kind of stuck there. Yeah, that minigun didn't play the game. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that pretty much wrapped up your tour in Vietnam. Well, I was there till the next February, and this this was uh, at the big fire base we got there. That that, that was in March, and I didn't leave till the next February. Mm -hmm. So. We did all, you know, maintain and work on radar here and there. We shot out a little bit. Okay. But, uh, one thing that really puzzled me, and that I can't, I don't know why, I don't remember Christmas Day. Oh, really? Nothing. Yeah, it was just another day. Christmas Day it was not Christmas. Wow. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Wow. So just another day. Another day, yeah. That's yeah. Right. I remember New Year's, but I don't remember Christmas Day. And wow. I don't know what happened that day. Wow. And so what happened when you finally got back to the States? Uh, we landed in uh, Washington State. And uh, <clears throat> not, not a good... I got over there on Valentine's Day. I came back on Valentine's Day. Uh. And I got, my, I got a plane to San Diego. My mom and dad were in El Cajon, which is close to San Diego. Yeah. So I called them, and uh, my dad shut down his garage there, saying he was all garage. Went up to pick me up, right? I got there. And uh, my mom was all going for me, because of that little thing she had, and he was scared to death and everything. She didn't know. 
Yeah, yeah. I never did tell him either. But, uh, anyway, so I said, well, I got a picture in there in my, my bunker. There are uh, two boys on the wall and my mini 14, my, my, my M14 hanging on the wall. I want to see my boys. And, and my mom says, well, they didn't come. She wouldn't call. Sure. Could she hear my boys? I got back February 14th, and I didn't see my boys till April the 20th. Oh, wow. And it was up and down from there, order. She was sleeping with somebody I knew. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's crazy. See, that's, that's ridiculous. Spent all that time over there. I saw a guy in the Vietnam kill herself because of that dear John letter. Yeah. People don't realize, and what I did finally see my ex mother and father in law. I showed him some of my pics. I had two big photo albums, this thick and like that, they're big ones. Uh -huh. My ex did them all the way, trashed them. Wow. So the ones I've got, so what's in there, like the made them off of color slides, if you remember what they are. Yeah. And now, uh, very my father in law, big father in law, like six foot two or three or something. And, you know, you didn't tell us there's any fight going on over there. And I said, I didn't want to worry anybody. You know, you trash this, you come back. And I felt like saying, you know, you have it. <laughs> they were millionaires. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know at the time I married your daughter. But oh, wow. I married her. But... Wow. Uh, I had no trouble with them my whole career. Hmm. Yeah, so so now you're going through a divorce at this point, and... Uh... I went to Fort Borden. Uh-huh. Instructor out there, and she just said she got to come out there. So she came out there, and... We didn't get along too well, and then she took off and left, and I come home, and everything was gone. Every time she leaves, she'd take everything. Oh, wow. And, uh, but anyway, so we got a divorce, divorce some point in time, and I wanted my, girl, my boys, but I had to marry her to get my boys. I married her again. I would never do that again. <laughs> she separated again, and I took everything I had. Wow. Crazy. Did when, it again. When I was in Germany, uh, she came over there, and... I think slept with everybody I worked with. Oh, geez. Wow. Duty one night, and uh, I told my first sergeant, I said, I got a, we live downtown in the colony. I had a practice for my little boy. And I uh, said, uh, be okay if I took a little extra time at lunch, I'll go get on the bus and go down. It was a pretty day, and I went downtown, a beautiful place, Germany. I got, I was walking to the town, and there's a taxi set from my apartment, from my mm. wife, my mother in law, my little boy in the back seat. Gotta be kidding. Hmm. Huh. I turned and went in my apartment, and he's coming down the stairs with a suitcase in each, each hand, my father-in-law. He looked down at me and said, I'm sorry, Pat. I said, I know you are. I stepped aside, and got a taxi, and he went back to California. Wow. Wow. So it's just, uh, it takes a special kind of woman to be an army wife. Yeah. But anyway, so I've had quite a few. Wow. Wow. Disasters in my life there. Yeah. And it seems like the military divorce rates are actually quite high. They're actually higher than the national average. And, and that's for, you know, it's just the stress of living uh, and, and dealing with military lifestyle. It's a totally different culture and lifestyle. She came back to Germany, right? Yeah. Again. And I got, um, no, I was at, at Fort Borden. The last time I was, I got that when I was in at Fort Borden. And, uh, Getting more west time so many divorces, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I was back in Germany again yeah. for the last time. Then I'll go back to Fort Bowen. Yeah. For my last couple of years. My wife was over there and uh, I had duty one night and I told my my sister, I said, Go watch the place. I'm gonna be about thirty minutes. I went back to my house. Nobody slept in the beds, nobody was there. Hmm. So I went back real quick. So the next morning I come in. The beds were all messed up. She had breakfast made and everything was, you know, the way it should be. And I started telling her, I was, well, you know, I was here last night. You weren't here. Where were you at? She got a part-time job working at Ramstein Air, Air Base. Huh. Working at Bowl Alley. And there was a guy, she met a guy there. There it went, you know. And she said, oh, wow. oh this old lady's got to be bringing her home. So I'd watch at night sometimes. Old lady brought her home. Well, anyway, so this guy that she was sleeping with was in the Air Force, sleeping in the government quarters, and his wife was in the States. Oh, wow. So that was a no-no. Yeah, yeah. I could have busted him right there. Anyway, I had to, 
two weeks left, and I got went to a transit barracks uh-huh. and cleaned them up, barracks up, and went to pay deposit on it. And uh, he did a like her stand there helping me in the apartment. Oh. Well, so anyways, we went to the transit barracks and had him all my whole bags sent to California because they would not send to one place. Well, I was going to Fort Borden. So she took it all there. She said, everything in my life, she'd get my parents. They never saw anything. Oh, wow. So, uh, so yeah. I had a uh, couple of stairs. She said, two bold speakers like this high, man. Uh. Oh, they were beautiful. And I was wrapping them all up. I got to mail them to me at Fort Borden because I knew she, I would never see them again. And I couldn't find nothing to cut paper with strings. I went to that, like, the common kitchen area for the apartments there. Yeah. I got a big bush in there, but it's all I could find. So I'm cutting the paper words. Somebody came to the door. I walked to the door, and I thought he had a knife in my hand. Opened the door. He started walking the door. He was drunk. Oh, wow. Put that knife to his throat. I said, what do you want? But there they took everything I had, and I just cut his head off right there. And it was her boyfriend. He old lady, your boyfriend's out there. She come out and her face turned white. She went to talk to him about two or three hours, and she said, well, he wants you to pay my way back. And she's on the travel order. And and you go by yourself to Fort Gordon. He wants me to pay your whack for him. Oh, wow. Thanks, so you come back on your orders, but you can walk. Wow. And, uh, anyway, she wrote, she went back with me. She got planned Fort Gordon, you know, Augusta, uh-huh. back to California. Wow. Thanks, special kind of woman to be here. Yeah. Oh, she was special, all right. Yeah. Um, and those that do have a good woman and a servant in the military, you know, um, it, it you know, that they must be very fortunate. Yeah. Yeah. They must have done some right things there. Did you retire out of the uh, army? Nine and a half years. Nine and a half years. Okay. So I got out of Fort Gordon. So what'd you do when you got out of Fort Gordon? Back to California. Okay. Well, after that, I married, I married another girl that lived here. We got married and we went back to California, but. I didn't like California anymore. I didn't like, so we came back here, you know. Been here ever since. Oh, wow. I was instructor for four years of electronics out there at Fort Gordon. Okay. That's what took my training in electronics. And you taught uh, AIT soldiers, yeah. Can't remember everything. It all happened this long ago. Yeah, yeah. All right, Pat. Well, uh, definitely appreciate you talking with us and uh, sharing that information. Is there anything else you would... Uh, Want to, want to talk about? I can't, can't take anything right off. Any, any questions you got? Yeah, so if there's uh, if there's any th- advice you'd give for the younger generations, especially ones joining the military or uh, ones trying to uh, advance themselves in, in life, you know, what would you what would you suggest? The way the world is right now, don't join the military. I just know the way the Vietnam veterans were treated, still are treated. And, uh, we definitely got the dirty end of the stick. Yeah. I wouldn't have anybody, especially if I was a parent, I wouldn't want my son or daughter to join the military right now. It's just uh, the way the world's going right now. I mean, yeah. there's going to be wars everywhere real quick. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's not, uh, not something to like to think about with all the tension that's around the world, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of folks that don't want to join the military. But there, there are benefits, you know, if you stay there and there wasn't a war, but I mean, you know, like, look at North Korea and China, I mean, they have to, and then Russia, what they're doing, they're killing people. Why? Good. Why just killing people? Why? Yeah. These people didn't do anything. I can tell you a couple of things that happened to me. Take just a minute. You yeah, go ahead. I was resetting some old trip flares that were out on the perimeter. Uh-huh. And she's familiar with those. They're almost like a hanger. They got a pin, you pull it, and they pop out. She's a flame about that high. And white washers or something, what it is, this high. Yeah. I was down there, and these old ones, they were taking them out. Well, I grabbed a spoon, and we, we could pop it. And I grabbed it, and it blew up in my hand. And I jumped back real quick, and I couldn't see anything because. Super bright, and, yeah. And uh, I kept looking down there. What was going on? I looked at my hand. My fingers, they were marshmallows look when you catch them on fire. Yeah. One of my fingers looked like that. My, son, my whole hand just asked my heart started pulsing in and so I told the guard I was, you know, call somebody. They took me up there and the guy looked at it. He got some kind of cold thing, sprayed it, made it kill the pain, I guess. He looked and I said, Man, you got almost third degree burst, you gotta got lose that hand. And I said, 
I hope not. I don't remember anything. Where I went, what I did. I was back to work, and there's my hand. Huh. I don't know. I had these little flashbacks, but I remember seeing women in uniform, nurses. I don't remember what was going on. So you kind of like blacked out? God, I guess they might have sedated me, you know. Oh, wow. My hand was really painful. Yeah. There's no sign of it. Huh. And then another time, we work in an air-conditioned van, the yeah. radar, because they had something cool. And they had like a, they were sitting on a low place to end, like a boardwalk that went out to it. And I was down there working, and I was in there, just, I started sweating. It was real hot. I said, man, I don't feel good. So I went back up to the shop, and I said, is this hot? He said, it ain't that hot. I said, you need to go to medical. And they somehow got back to my, my little bitty room. I got a picture of my room in here. Wow. Uh, and a bottle. They had a glass bottle back then, like little pine bottles. One was like clear green, and the other was milky green. And had the instruction what to do with it. And I took my room, you know. When then I woke up, the bottles were almost empty. And I felt better. Mm. To this day, I don't know what it was. Mm. I have to look that up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, after that, but. Yeah, another question. So when it comes down to the M16 and the M14, which one would you prefer to have in Vietnam? So you used them both, yeah. The one I had, M14. The M14. So I qualified with that in uh, basic training. I was talking with one of the guys at the toy shop, and I said, uh, we, we had and he's peep side. The guy looked responsible peep side. Hmm. This guy's a veteran. Wow. They're using electronic slash. Yeah, they, oh, yeah, yeah. Site. Yeah. Uh, they had pop, went up a hillside and it was all bushes, you know. Uh-huh. Had pop-up park. If you just see it pop up, you missed it. It didn't stay there long. Yeah. I qualified at 500 meters. Couldn't miss. Wow. The peep site. 25 yards, 25 meters, 50. 500. I couldn't miss. Wow. It was a good shooting rifle. And I like the firepower. It had the capabilities. And I'm a little bit heavier, but you get in combat, you don't worry about weight. You don't worry about a recoil. Hmm. It's just like you go, go deer hunting. You deer sign your scope and it kicks and hurts. You shoot that deer, you don't feel a thing. Yeah, you don't. It's nothing. So, I mean, it's just the way it is. Yeah. But it was a good rifle to serve very well. And uh, I'd pick it again. Okay. Okay. You know, All right. Then it didn't have quite the knockdown power. I mean, I seen. Some guys take 20 rounds and shoot back. Oh, wow. M16 is a high-speed needle. You know, it's just go straight, unless you get a, a main ball or something, you know, it's, it's going to go through you. They're going to die. But you go in and you look at the guy that's dead, and he's got an opium pipe stuck in his belt. He didn't feel nothing. Yeah. So that M14 made a difference. Wow. Wow. I'm sure it did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's why, that's probably why the uh, U.S. military is probably... Uh, now adopting a service rifle uh, that fires a 6.8 caliber. I didn't see anything wrong with three a week. <laughs> I liked it. One more thing. One more thing. Coming right. back, I was in uniform yeah. coming back. It was just me. Mm-hmm. I was a replacement. I came back. And the guys that went over the unit and the ones that made it back came back. They were in uniform. And the hippies threw all kinds of stuff at them. At the, oh, wow. airports, at the airports. And uh, this sends you a hip reason to look at it. So they spit on them, they threw stuff at them. Oh, crap. What yeah, things, they. Anything. Just really? Them, you know? And these are together probably draft dodgers. Yeah, yeah. You know? Uh-huh. And, uh, and they. Yeah, it was crazy how I they got lucky treated. I came back by myself. Wow. I was lucky I came back anyway. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Good. How was uh... Well, Pat, thanks for sharing your story with us. Uh, really appreciate it, and I think it's important to pass on the legacy uh, and share these stories with you guys, with the future generations, so that uh, the past lives on and we remember our service members. Um, with that being said, if you guys like this kind of content and you want to share, you want to see more, uh, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe. Uh, We'll be doing some more interviews with uh, more veterans, especially the ones uh, from Vietnam War. Uh, It seems to be a a higher topic of discussion as of lately, uh, since a lot of the veterans are passing away um, 
during this time. So uh, definitely appreciate it uh, for tuning in. Thank you guys. And as always, be sure to learn history and curate history. Make it a great day. Yeah.